All right, y'all, so 2.1, it's going to deal with graphs of equations. All right, so for our number one, they want us to graph y equals two-thirds x plus one. Now, since this one's already solved for the y, I'm going to make me a table, pick me out a couple x values, plug them in and get my y values. Once I got my two points, we're going to graph them and be done. Now, y'all, one number I'm always going to use. Now, this has just got an X variable. So that means in math labs, this graph is going to make a straight line. And in math lab, we would use the line tool, okay? So... When I got a straight line graph like this, I always pick zero. Now, my second X value that I'm going to pick, since this is a fraction, and I don't want to get on there and have to graph fraction type points, my second point when I got a fraction always matches the bottom of that fraction or the denominator. So the second X I would pick would be a three. And then when I work it out, you'll see why I picked these two numbers. So first, let me plug a zero in for that X and see what we get for that Y value. And y'all, I love zero because zero times anything is a big zero. So zero times two thirds will give me zero plus my one. And then zero plus one gives me a one. So y'all, when that X value is zero, my Y value will be a one. Now, let me show you why I picked that three. So we we'll have Y equals two thirds times three plus one. So when you got a fraction multiplied by a whole number like that, I'm able to come in, cancel those threes out because three divided by three makes that a one. So now I got two times one is two plus my one at the end. And then two plus one will give us three. So if you got a fraction and you don't want to have to find common denominators and all that fun stuff, pick an X value that'll cancel that out. That comes out as a whole number now. So when X was three, Y was three. All right, y'all, let me let one in real quick. Hey, y'all. All righty. All right, y'all, so now I got two points. I got zero, one, and I got three, three. Remember, the X's go left or right. The Y values go up or down. Now, starting in the center, that's the zero point for the X. Because remember, they go positive right, negative left. So I would stay right in the center. My Y value is one. So I would go up one and put my first point. So when your X value is zero, your point will be on that Y axis somewhere, okay? Now my second point, three, three. So for that one, I would start in the center. X being three, I would go right until I got to the three. From there, my Y value being three, I would go up three and put my second point. Now, when y'all are doing this in math lab at that point, it's automatically going to draw that line for you, okay? So your line should come through and go uphill. Y'all, if this number in front of the X is positive, Anytime that's a positive number, your graph is going to go uphill from the left to the right. If that was a negative number in front of that X, then your graph would sort of go downhill, okay?
Uh, so remember on the straight line graphs, we need two points, pick a zero, and then any other number that you want to. But like I said, if you don't want to mess with fractions, cancel that thing out, okay? So for our second one, I've got a 6y plus 3x equals 12. So y'all, whether you put this one in the calculator or do it by hand, the first thing you got to do to this problem is solve that for the Y. Once I got it solved for the Y, I'll be able to pick out my two X values, get the Y values, and then plot it. But you want to be able to solve these for the Y. So when the X's and the Y's are on the same side, my first goal is to move the 3X to the other side. And to move that 3x, you got to add its opposite. So you'd come in there. The opposite of a positive 3x will be a negative 3x. And we got to do that both sides of that equal sign, right? So notice, this 6y will come down. On the left side, the 3x's are going to cancel out. So I'm going to have equals. On the right side, 12 and that negative 3x, they are not like terms. So we cannot add or subtract those. All we can do is put it how it looks. 12 minus 3x. Now, if you wanted to, you could have put negative 3x plus 12. Order don't matter on that side, okay? Just remember that you cannot add X's to numbers. So, y'all, we got a 6Y here. We want to turn that 6Y into a 1Y. So, to turn a 6Y into a 1Y, we're going to divide everybody by that 6. Now, Division is like multiplication. You got to distribute it through to every single term of this, okay? So we'll take the 12, divide by the 6, minus my 3, divided by my 6, and my x. Whoops, y'all, that's a minus in there. It's hard to tell. There we go. So this should be 12 over 6 minus 3 over 6x. But well, y'all, look at this. 6 divided by 6, those cancel making me a 1y like I need. 12 divided by 6 will divide and give us, what, a 2 minus. Now, y'all, I can't take a 3 and divide by 6, but I can reduce that. So remember, 3 over 6, both of them have 3s in them. So if you divide the top and bottom by three, you'll get a one half and then my X. So you got to be able to reduce your fractions if they don't divide, okay? So now that I got it solved for the Y, I'm going to come in and set up my table. So I'll remember, I'm still picking me a zero. Because of that fraction. So let me ask y'all this. Remember what I said about the fractions? What would my second X be? It would be a one, would it? Well, if you put a one there. A you're two for the number. Two, a two. two. There you go. I definitely want that to be a two. That way we can cancel that fraction. And we don't have to find common denominators and all that fun stuff. So, y'all, let's put our two numbers into this equation and see what the y values would be. So, first, I'm going to have 2 minus 1 half times that 0. Well, that's nice because bring down that 2 minus 1 half times 0 is a big 0. So remember, we're following order of operations on these. So we got to do the multiplying before we do the adding and the subtracting. 
All right, y'all, two minus zero gives me a two. So when X was zero, Y was two. Now we said we're going to put in a two, so that's going to give us equals two minus one half times that two. And y'all remember, same thing as I did here. This two that y'all picked will cancel with that two on the bottom of that fraction, making that into a one. So I'm going to bring down my two, my minus. And y'all, that's basically, when you cancel out those denominators, what's left on top becomes the next number. So since I had a one on top, I'm going to bring that one down. All right, y'all, two minus one gives me a one. So the second point I'm going to graph is a two, one. Now remember, this is still a single X in here with no exponents on it. So we're still going to choose our line tool for this one. Okay. All right, y'all, so zero, two. Starting in the center for zero on the X, I would go up two for the Y. So once again, it's on that Y axis since I had a zero for the X. Two, one. My second point, two, one. I would start in the center, go right over to two, and then up one. Now notice, this fraction in front of that X was negative. And y'all remember, if the number in front of the X is negative, that graph is going to go downhill from left to right. So let me see if I can draw this. So downhill, left to right. Tell you also, that's a trick on the graphs that just have these X's in them like this. Two points, draw your straight line, and be done with that, okay? So let's try some X squared graphs. I'm going to have Y equals X squared. All right, y'all, um, I just had someone that came on under iPhone. Who is that? Um, I think it's me, Kiara Wainwright. Wainwright, okay, I got you. And I'll put iPhone by your name so I'll know. <laughs> All righty, y'all. Now... These X squared graphs in math lab, we're going to pick the parabola tool, which looks like a U. And it's going to have three dots on it, meaning I need three points. Y'all, here's the trick on this one. Any of the X squared graphs, whether it's the X squared, negative X squared, X squared plus two, x squared minus five. If it's got an x squared in it, your three numbers you want to pick for the x are negative one, zero, and one. You're going to notice something on these. These graphs are symmetric. So whatever you get for the negative numbers, you'll get for the positive numbers when you square them. Y'all, let's put in that negative one. That's going to give me y equals negative 1 squared. And y'all, let me tell you something. On the calculator, when you put in negative numbers, especially on the calculator, put those negative numbers inside parentheses. So let me ask y'all this. What sign will the answer have if you're multiplying like signs?
Would it be a negative? Well, if you multiply two negatives, what are you going to get? A positive. A positive. And the same thing, if you multiply two positives, you're going to get a positive. So no matter what, whether this is positive or negative, when you square it, it's going to be positive, okay? The only way you'll get a negative on that is if they got a negative up in front of that x squared. So negative 1 times negative 1 is a positive 1. So that's going to give me a y value of 1. When I put that 0 in, well, y'all, 0 squared is a big O. 0. So when x is 0, y will be 0. And then let's put in a positive 1. Now, positive numbers, you don't have to worry about those parentheses as much. But I beg you, if you are putting in negative numbers, put them negative numbers in parentheses. All right, and guess what? One times one is one. So notice how the negative and positive ones both gave me the same y values. If you use a negative two, positive two, you'll get the same y values, okay? All right, y'all, so on this one, I'm going to go over here to negative 1, up 1. 0, 0 is right in the center. And let me ask y'all this. Do y'all remember what we call the center of this graph? It starts with an O. The origin. The origin. origin. There you go. Good job. All righty, then we had one, one, so that'll be right, one, up, one. Once you plot that last point on Math Lab, it's going to come in and draw you a nice little parabola, parabola okay? So remember, X squared graphs, we use the three point. They might call it a X squared tool, okay? All right, y'all, watch this one. Y equals, I got a bar and then an X plus three. So first question, what's these bars? Is it absolute value? It is definitely absolute value. Now, I'll say on the calculator to get the absolute value on the calculator. On the calculator, you hit the math button. And then you arrow over to the number. Call them and highlight it. And the first thing you see under that is ABS, which is absolute value. All right, y'all, this one's a little bit picky on the X and Y values. This absolute value graph in Math Lab is going to make a V shape and it's going to have two dots on it. Y'all listen here though. The first point you got to plot in Math Lab is this little what we call vertex point. The, the point there has to be the first point you're plotting Math Lab, okay? Now, What'll give you that point is to find me an X value that'll make this equal zero inside those bars. So what X value, when I add it to three, is going to make that equal zero in there? Negative three. Negative three. Okay, y'all, so just remember, the first X you pick on the absolute value the first point you plot has to make it equal zero inside here. So let's put that in. Y equals absolute value of negative three plus three. So work the inside first. Then we'll take that absolute value. We always said negative three plus three will give us a zero. And the absolute value of zero is... Zero. A big zero? Zero. 
All right. Now, usually what I do, if I know this number is what made it equal to zero, I'll pick a number that's right next to this usually. So I would probably either pick a negative four or maybe a negative two as my second point. But y'all, you can pick any number here. I usually try to keep numbers sort of close so that I don't have to draw me a graph way out there, okay? So y'all, let's put this negative two plus three. Now remember, we're working on the inside first. So negative two plus three will give us a positive one. one. And then the absolute value of one is? One. One, there you go. So y'all, let me, let me ask y'all this. Say that I had put a negative four here as my other point. And I'm going to put that into the graph real quick, into my problem real quick. So what if I had put that negative four in here plus my three? So what's a negative four plus three going to give us? Negative one. So I got a negative one. And then what is the absolute value of a negative one? Positive one. Positive one. one. Good job. Remember, absolute value always comes out positive because it just measures distance and not direction. All right, y'all, so watch this. My first point on this absolute value has to be on the x-axis. So I got negative three, zero. If I come over here to negative three, just the y value zero, I would sit there. Now, my second point was a negative two, one. So I'm going to come over here to negative two, go up one. Now, at that point, Math Lab is going to draw the graph because it only requires two points. But I'm going to show you. I'm going to go over here to negative four and one and put that point. And y'all look at this. Absolute value is going to make a sharp V graph for us. Um, but like I said, once you put your vertex point in any other point, Math Lab will draw the whole thing for you. It automatically mirrors what one side does, okay? All right, y'all, so let me let y'all catch up a second there. I'll do one more out of 2.1, and then we're going to step into 2.2 there, okay? Ooh, my paper's curling up on me. Hey, y'all, so I'll flip the page and we'll do number my number five for you. Now let me get that pulled back up again. So number five wants me to graph y equals x to the third minus two. This, since it's got an exponent three, we call this a cubic graph in math lab. The tool for this graph is going to look like a squiggly line. And y'all guess what? This thing has four dots on it. That means we're going to need four X values and four Y values. So y'all, let's think about this. That's a cube. So I'm still going to use a zero. How about a one? Because one times one times one is just going to be a one, right? Uh, I would probably use a negative one. And then I'd probably use either a positive or negative two. So for me, I'm just going to use a positive two. 
So y'all think about this. What if you picked a three? What is three to the third power going to give you? So remember, that's three times three times three. That's 27. But y'all, my graph I'm using only goes out to 10. So I don't really want to have to go out about 27 on this, okay? So on this cube graph, keep them numbers small as you can, okay? All right, so first let's put in a zero. Zero to the third minus two. Well, zero times zero times zero is zero minus two. And that's going to give us a negative two. We picked a one, so we're going to have one to the third minus two. Well, y'all, one times one times one is one. And then one minus two will give us what? A negative one. Let's put in that negative one now. So y equals negative one to the third minus two. So y'all, what sign is that going to be if that's a negative times a negative times a negative? Positive, positive one. Oh. We all think about this. Oh, it's going to be a negative. It's going to be a negative because the first two negatives will make a positive. But when you multiply that positive times that last negative, it's going to make that thing a negative. So negative numbers to even exponents will be positive, but negative numbers to odd exponents will stay negative, okay? So that's going to give us a negative 1 minus 2. So y'all, negative 1 minus 2 will give me what? A negative 3. All right, now I'm going to put in that 2. Y equals 2 to the third. Minus two. So y'all figure out two to the third for me. If you say six, I'm kicking you out. It's eight. It's eight. eight. There you go. <laughs> That's going to give me what? An eight minus two. And then eight minus two gives us a six. So we got our four points. We would go into math lab, choose that four point cubic tool. And here we go, zero, negative two, zero in the middle, go down two. I got one negative one, so I'm going to go right one and down one. I got a negative one, negative three, so I'm going to go left to negative one and then down to negative three. And then finally I had a two, six. So I'm going to go right to 2 and up to 6. Now, when you put the fourth point, Math Lab is going to come in here and draw you a sort of curvy line. All right, y'all, so that's five of them. There's seven all together, but the other one is like an X squared plus two type graph. So you'd pick the same numbers that we picked on the other X squared graph, okay? So let me let y'all get that real quick, and then we'll move into 2.2. All right, y'all, so I'm going to use my blank paper now. All right, y'all, so 2.2 .2 deals with functions and graphs. All right, y'all. So let's define a function. So for this section, a function is what we call a correspondence. Oops. 
Well, let me let one in real quick. Hey, uh, a correspondence in which each member of the domain and y'all let me say this the domain is basically all the x values so that's going to be your x's so it's a correspondence in which each member of the domain corresponds to one and only one So, corresponds to one and only one member of the range. And y'all remember, your range is going to be those Y values. So, what does this mean? This means that your domains don't get a choice between the range values. The domain can only have one range value, okay? So the X's have no choice, but one. They only get one choice, just like your paycheck. If you work 30 hours, you want your pay to be your hours times your uh, whatever your pay is. You don't want to give your boss a choice on what he's going to pay you because I guarantee you they're going to pay you the lower of the two, right? So we want to be able to put in one number for the X's and get one answer out for those Y values. So I'm going to draw a few correspondences here and we're going to determine if these are a function or not. based off of what we just said here, okay? So my first problem, I'm gonna list my domain on the left and I'll list my range on the right. So for my domain, I got an 18, a 21, and a 14. My range has a 17 and a 25. So y'all, this 18 points to the 17. This 21 points to the 25. This 14 here points to the 17. So my question is this a function? No. Yes. Oh, I got a yes and a no. So let's yes. see. Let's go by what this is saying. No, it's not. It's not. Oh, why don't you go against yourself? Watch this. This domain value 18. How many range values does it have? One. That 18 only points to the 17. Good job. This domain value 21. How many yeah. range values? It only goes to one. This 14. X value 14. How many does it have? One. So that better be a? Function. A function. Good job. Now, we didn't say X values couldn't share a Y value, right? That's where oh. I missed up it. Okay. Uh -huh. All we said was, hey, these X values can only have one Y value per themselves, okay? Can you, can you repeat that last one more time, why the 14 is a function? Because oh. it pairs with 18? Well, because the 18 is the first X value on here, and it only has one Y value. Okay. This 21, the second X value only has one Y value that it's pointing to. The 14 is my third X value, but guess what? 
it only has one Y value. So since all these X values only have one Y value, this is would definitely be a function. Okay. Okay. So sort of like, have y'all heard of uh, salary type pay? No matter how many hours you work, you get yeah. that salary. Yeah. So I could have worked 18 hours. I could have worked 14 hours, and I would have got the same pay if I was on a salary, right? So X's can share a Y value, but the X's cannot have more than one Y value. So let's play with another one of those. Domain and our range. All righty, so this one I got a negative three, negative four, and a six. Over here I have a zero, nine, ten, and fourteen. So y'all, this negative three goes to the zero. This negative four is pointing to the nine. And it's pointing to the 10. And then the 6 at the bottom, pointing to the 14. So the question, is this a function? No. 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 So why would y'all say no? Because the negative 4 is sure to them. Perfect. This X value has more than one Y value, so that violates what we said. So good job, y'all. That's a big old no. So we just go by based off what they beside, like what's beside them, pretty much. Yeah, whatever they're pointing to. So, so this is like negative three zero would be your first point. This one would be like negative four nine, negative four ten, and then this one would be what six fourteen. But notice you got the same x value here with two different y values, okay? All right. So are there any exceptions to that rule, or is that just kind of an absolute standard? Um, just about an absolute standard on it. Um we, a good function, we want to be able to put one thing into it, get one answer out, just like them paychecks, right? All right, y'all, so I'm going to try one more of those. So let me have my domain and my range. So y'all, my domain, I'm going to put a 5, a 10, and a 15. For my range, I'm going to put 72. All three of my domain numbers are pointing at 72. So the question, is this a function? Yes. 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 And this one, sort of what I was talking about, the salary, right? No matter how many hours you work, you get the same pay. And we know it's a function because each one of these X's only had one Y value. Okay. So if you think about it, X's can share a Y. But the Y can't share two different X's. I cannot have two X. I cannot have the same X going to two different Y values, okay? So y'all, this is leading up into what we call function notation. And y'all have probably seen this before. This is that f of x. So we call this f of x. 
Now, really, this f of x is just symbolism. Um, sometimes they'll put a different letter than an f depending on the equation. Like if I was doing paychecks, I probably wouldn't put an f. I'd probably put a p, okay? So this is just notation. So I call it um, notation to let us know. that we have a function. Now, if I put a number in place of the X, so if a number is given in place of X, That means that we're going to substitute that number into the function for the x. So then we substitute that number into the function in place of the x. So I'm going to give us a function on this example. The function we're going to be given is going to be h of x equals x plus 13. They want us to find, let's see, they want me to find h of 0 h of a negative 1, h of a negative 3, h of a 7, and finally, h of a c plus 15. So they want me to find five different functional values over here. Here's my function, x plus 13. So y'all, let's find h of zero. Now y'all, here's the thing. We don't do nothing with this h of zero. Our problem is going to be working whatever we put in for the x plus the 13. So when I got an h of zero, they want me to replace that x with a zero. So this will give me a zero plus 13. So y'all, H of zero equals 13. 13. Okay. So now remember, this was just symbolism telling me what I was going to put in for the X. We don't use it in, in uh, it's not, it's not an equation. We're just working that right side. So what was next? H of negative one. So now they want me to take this function and put a negative 1 in place of that x. So that's going to give me negative 1 plus 13. All right, y'all. So h of negative 1 will give us? 12. 12. Good job. All right, let's see. Next was the h of a negative 3. So we take our function, put that negative 3 in for the x. So if you see what they're hitting you on this side is adding all these unlike signs, right? So how about this? H of negative 3 equals? 10. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. All right, let's see. Next, I had, what, an H of 7. So I'm going to come in and put a 7 in place of that X. All right, y'all, H of 7. 20. Now the tricky one, y'all. Look at this. They got an H of a C plus 15. So what do y'all think I'm putting in place of that X? C plus 15. C plus 15. 
So I got my C plus 15 plus my 13 at the end. So I got a big X plus my 13. So y'all, here's the question. What is H of C plus 15? Give me. Would you Would subtract negative two on both sides? Oh, so remember, this ain't an equation, so we're not doing nothing on this side. We're only no, working. Just, are we going to subtract from both? Subtract are we going to take from the 13? Yeah. Are well, you going to combine like terms? Combine like terms. That's it. Because remember, don't treat this like an equation. This side has no bearing on the problem. It's just telling me what I put in for the X, okay? So, y'all, the only thing you can do is it's combine a. those like terms. So, I'm going to bring that C down. And I'm going to have what? C plus? 28. 28. Okay. So on the function, that left side is not part of that problem. So you don't want to do that subtracting and then whatever to both sides. Okay. Only work that right side. Get it as far as you can simplify it and be done. All right, y'all. Let's move to our next one. So let me see what they're giving us here. I'm going to turn my paper over. I hate it when it folds. All right, so this one, we're given f of x is going to equal x to the third power. They want us to find f of 0. f of a negative 1, f of 4, f of 8, f of a negative 2, and finally, f of a negative three A. So we're going to put a variable on all these to get y'all good at them uh, variables, okay? So y'all, let's start out with F of zero. So I'm going to put a zero in for the X and cube it. Well, zero to the third power. Zero. Zero. There you go. Good job. So now we got f to the negative 1. So I always like to put my negatives in parentheses. But y'all remember, a negative to the negative times a negative. We know this answer will be negative 1. Negative, negative one. 1. Good job. All right, well, ooh, what's next? f of 4. So we're going to have a Four to the third power. 64. 64. Ooh, it's getting big, ain't it? Four times four times four is definitely 64. Well, y'all look here. We got a bigger one coming up. That's an F of an eight. So that's going to be eight to the third power. So figure that one out. Eight times eight. Oh, what'd you just say? That sounded good. 512. 512. That's what I was talking about when we're doing that cubic one. I keep them numbers small because, Lord, if we'd have put an 8 on that cubic graph wall go, we'd have to draw Y values up to 512. Not for me, right? <laughs> All right, y'all, negative 2 to the third power. What are y'all getting? Negative eight. Negative eight. So I guess my tricky one is going to be F of a negative three A. That's going to equal negative three A to the third power. Now I will say to help you on this, you see this A right here? It don't have an exponent by it. What would its exponent be? One. A one. one. There you go. So treat it like an A to the first. So now, 
This is sort of two parts. We're going to figure out the number first, and then we'll figure out the A. So first of all, what's negative 3 to the third power? Negative 27. Now, this is an A to the first. A times A times A is what? A cubed. A cubed. Good job. Now, I will say this. A quick way to do the variables, multiply those exponents. One times three is three and be done, okay? All right, let me find this other one I had here real quick. Okay, y'all, for this one, we're given f of x equals the absolute value of x minus 4. We're going to find f of 2, f of 3, and a f of a plus 4. All right, so I'm going to start out with this f of 2. f of 2, and all I got to do is put the 2 in for the x, so that's going to be the absolute value of 2 minus my 4. So remember, in order of operations, you're going to treat absolute value, same thing as parentheses. So absolute value of 2 is? Two. So I now have 2 minus 4. So that means 2 minus 4 will give us a negative give two. 2. There you go. All right, what's next? F of 3. Absolute value of 3 minus 4. All right, also, once again, absolute value of 3 is 3. So that's going to give us 3 minus 4. And let's see, 3 minus 4? Negative, Negative 1. Negative 1. Good job. So look, here's the variable again. I got a f of a plus 4. That's going to equal the absolute value of a plus 4. And then... Minus four. Y'all, let me tell y'all the truth on this one. They're trying to trick you into thinking you can add this four to that negative four. You cannot do that. In fact, this is a trick question, and you cannot do anything to this one. So this one would be my final answer. This one does not simplify. So I, I don't like that in this because I always like to do some kind of work to the problems. But this one, they're just trying to trick you and having you put like A. Um, but just remember, things inside parentheses cannot add to things outside of parentheses, okay? And since we don't know what the A is, whether it could be a positive number or a negative number, we're not able to go any further on that, okay? All right, y'all. So the next thing I'm going to show you, and sort of like an application, which is like a word problem using this. So, y'all, we're going to be given F of C. So notice, now my variable is a C and it's not an X. But F of C equals 9 fifth C plus 32. So y'all, let me ask you this. Do any of y'all know what this formula is for? No. Oh. 
Y'all telling me my, my education system was letting me down. But let me tell you what this is for. This formula finds the Fahrenheit temperature if you're given the Celsius temperature. Celsius, yeah. So this one converts from Celsius into Fahrenheit. So what they want me to do to this one is find what Fahrenheit temperature is equivalent to a negative 15 degrees Celsius. So y'all, what's that mean? I'm going to be finding F of a what? So what did they give me for my Celsius temperature? 9 fifths C plus 32. Well, that's the formula. Negative 15. Oh, so, uh -huh, so that negative 15 is what we're going to be plugging into the formula. So we're basically going to be finding F of negative 15, which means negative 15 Celsius on this. So now we're going to bring down that formula. 9 fifths times C, which is negative 15, plus my 32. Now remember, this is just telling me what I put in for the Celsius to find this Fahrenheit. All we're going to do is work this right side. Now y'all, let me show you a trick. You could multiply 9 times negative 15, get a big number, then divide by 5. But remember how I was canceling them numbers a while ago on that fractional graph? I'm going to cancel this. This negative 15, if you take negative 15 and divide by that 5, what's that give us? 3. Negative 3. Negative 3. So now the fraction is gone, and we're going to take this 9 and multiply that negative 3 by it. So that's going to give us, what, a negative 27 plus or 32. Remember, you can do that either way. I like to divide first because you get smaller numbers to play with. But, y'all, you could have did 9 times negative 15. Oh, that would have gave you, what, 30, 60, 90, 1. That would give you, like, 135. And then that 135 divided by that 5 would have gave you that negative 27 still, okay? All right, y'all, so the question of the day, what does F of a negative 15 equal? Five. Five, there you go. Now, all you got to do is put in the five. Math Lab will already have that little degree thing, and they'll have that Fahrenheit there, okay? So, Math Lab, you're just going to put the five in, hit enter, and be done. All right, y'all, so... That's so, sort of an example question. of using a function for temperature, okay? I had a quick question for you. Yeah, I hear you. So that formula was for um, Celsius to Fahrenheit, right? Exactly. Okay. Now, to go the other way, I'll just show you. So see if you wanted C of F. Oh, what's that one? That one's uh, F minus 32, all of that, divided by, oh, let me play with this a second. Subtract on that, and then it's times five nines, I think. So you flip that upside down, and it's like, Five times that over nine. So, no biggie. Y'all, have y'all ever heard of the vertical line test? So, if we got a graph of a function, or just a graph, we can tell if a graph is a function or not 
So this tells me if I got a function or not. Now remember, your vertical lines are the ones that go up and down, right? So to use this vertical line test to tell if I got a function, to be a function, a vertical line And not intersect the graph more than once. What that means, if my vertical line can intersect the graph more than one time, that means my X's are getting choices, and we said that was not happening to be a function while ago, right? So that's why this vertical line, when I go through there, can only intersect my graph at one point, okay? So we're going to determine if a function So y'all, my first one, I'm going to come down. There's my X and my Y. So hell, let's do a parabola like we've been graphing. Those parabolas sort of curve up to the right and sort of curve up to the left. Now, vertical line test means if I start shooting a bunch of vertical lines on this, this first vertical line I shoot down, guess what? It only intersected the graph one time. If I do a vertical line right there, guess what? It only intersected that graph one time. If I shoot a vertical line right here, it's only intersected my graph one time. So y'all getting the picture? All these vertical lines I draw only intersect that graph one time. So since all these vertical lines only intersect at one time, this is what we would put as a yes. All these X values only had one Y value to pick from, okay? All right, so we'll let y'all catch up and then we'll do some more of these pictures. All right, y'all. Same thing on this one. So let me get my graph drawn. So this time I'm going to sort of do a sideways looking parabola. You get this something like a square root graph. Like the square root of four could be two or negative two. The square root of nine could be three or negative three and so on. But my question is this. Is that a function? No. No. No, because y'all, you no. can draw no. vertical lines all day long. And look, that vertical line intersected it twice. So since the vertical line intersected twice, it is definitely a no. See, this x value had two choices. Looks like all the x values got two choices other than the one on zero, right? And it all goes back to the x's don't get a choice. They only get one y value. Oh, we did some absolute values earlier too, remember? So here's my x and a y. So say we had an absolute value graph shooting up right here. Is that absolute value a function or not? Yes. 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 Yeah, because you can draw vertical lines all day, and they're only going to intersect it once here, once here, once here. No matter where I draw a vertical line, it intersects it no more than once. So that is definitely a yes. All right, so I'll take one more of these, and you'll have the idea.
Oh, how about a circle? It's not a function. It's not a function because, y'all, we start drawing vertical lines. We're intersecting it here. We're intersecting it here. That violates the rules of a function. So that is definitely a no. All right, so the only other thing I'm going to do for 2.2, I'm going to show you how to do a couple of these graphs, okay? So toward the, the vertical line test is pretty much at the end. Um, now, in here, on these graphs, they're going to give you a table. We're going to fill out the table and then graph them. But the difference in this section and the first section, they're now using f of x notation, okay? Remember, f of x is the same thing as a y. So how about this one? Negative 3 plus the absolute value of x. Now, on the table, they're giving me the numbers to use for the x. They're giving me negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. We're going to find the y values. Then we're going to plot it. So, y'all, let's start with that negative 2. F of negative 2 will equal negative 3 plus the absolute value of negative 2. So remember, got to start with absolute value first. So what is the absolute value of a negative 2? Positive 2. Positive 2. And then let's see, negative 3 plus 2 gives us a negative 1. All right, next we'll find f of negative 1. That'll equal negative 3 plus the absolute value of that negative 1. So first thing is the absolute value again, so bring down that negative 3. All right, absolute value negative 1. 1. All right, so I got negative 3 plus 1. So that's going to give us, what, a negative 2. All right, next is 0. So f of 0 will equal negative 3 plus the absolute value of 0. All right, bring down the negative 3. Absolute value of 0, we said, will go? 0. Uh-huh. And then negative 3 plus that is going to give us our negative 3. All right, let's put in that 1. F of 1 equals negative 3 plus absolute value of a positive 1. So I'm going to bring down my negative 3. y'all, absolute value of a positive 1. 1. There you go. And then negative 3 plus 1 gives us our negative 2. You're starting to see the symmetry over here, right? So let's yep. try F of 2. That'll equal negative 3 plus absolute value of 2. So, y'all, that's what? A negative 3 plus 2. Mm -hmm. And negative 3 plus 2 will give us a negative 1. So, let's say we was going to graph that. And these numbers are pretty small, so I'll just go out about five, it looks like. So, y'all, let me ask you this. Remember, absolute value is going to use that V-shaped tool with two points on it. Out of these points, what's the very first point I got to plot? 
What's going to give me that? Negative two, negative zero, three. and negative three. Zero, negative three. See how these ones are mirroring each other? But this one in the point in the middle is a zero, negative three. Then you got the negative twos on each side, the negative ones. So that middle point on here has to be the first point you plot. So you'll come over here to zero, to negative three. Then any other point, you can plot any of these other points for the second one. So I could do one, negative two. I go right one, down two. At that point, Math Lab's going to come in and draw the V and be done, okay? So I wanted to do this one to show you that you still got to try to catch that little vertex point first. All right, y'all, there's one more I wanted to do. Let me find it. Because uh, I think this one's sort of tricky, too. So this example, we're going to graph f of x equals negative x squared minus 2. Now, they're giving us the x values again. They're giving me a negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and a 2. So first of all, we're going to find f of this negative 2. Now, y'all, here's where I got a lot of mistakes. I'm putting a negative 2 in for that x, but this negative is still going to be here. So the first thing I'm going to do is bring that negative down. Then I'm going to put my negative 2 in parentheses, square it, and then minus my 2. So if you're putting a negative number in, that negative still going to be there, okay? Now here's the second mistake I get on this. You can't make this negative times negative into a positive 2. Because who's got priority here? That exponent's got priority. So you're going to bring this negative down. And then we're going to figure out what is negative 2 squared going to give us. So that's a negative 2 times a negative 2. That's going to give us a 4. And then at the end is a minus 2. So y'all, if you got a negative x squared... No matter what you put in for this X, it's still going to maintain that negative in front, okay? And watch this. Negative 4 minus neg uh, 2 is a negative 6. Uh -huh. Okay, y'all? So remember, if you got a negative X squared, no matter what I put in for the X, because of that negative, it's going to stay negative, okay? So remember that we're going to do f of negative 1 next. We're going to bring down the negative. Then we're going to put in our negative 1 and square that minus 2. So order of operations, exponents have priority over multiplying. So bring down your first negative. All right, negative 1 squared, negative 1 times negative 1 gives me a positive 1 there. And then bring down your minus 2. So once again, this negative kept that squared stuff negative. And then negative 1 minus 2 gives us a negative 3. So that was what? Negative 3 there. Now remember, this is the x squared graph, so it's going to look like that parabola, right? With three points. And... That means sooner or later, we're going to see a little symmetry on these y values. So let's try this f of 0. That'll equal negative times 0 squared minus 2. We all 0 squared is 0. And a 0 times that negative would be like 0 times negative 1, which will still give me a 0. Bring down your minus 2. And 0 minus 2 gives us a... Minus 
All right, next I got a one, so I'm going to find F of one will equal negative one squared minus two. Now, you can put the one in parentheses or, or without them, remember, on that. Um, but this negative is coming down again. And then one squared is one times one, which will give me a one. And then bring down that minus two. Oh, right, y'all, look at that. Negative one minus two gives us a negative three. So, y'all, can y'all guess what this one will be by looking at my table? Negative six. It's going to be a negative mm -hmm. six. So, let's officially, we'll put in a two here. So bring down that negative, and then you got two squared minus two. So the negative comes down, two squared is four, bring down that minus two, and look at that, perfect, that's a negative six. Now on this one, you just need to plot three points. I don't think it matters what three points you pick. Um, now, myself, I'm, I always like doing these vertex points first. So if I was going to do the vertex point first, I would do the zero, negative two, and then any other two points, okay? So, y'all, that's the main thing on our uh, college algebra. Um. Let me put one more name in here. Uh, all right, he must have got knocked off. So, so the support's going to do some of these straight lines and stuff. Um, but I wanted to show y'all a problem from the support for 2.1. Um, and let me see. Is 2.5 a solution of y equals 2x plus 1. So the first couple problems in support deal with this kind of problem. Now remember, they're giving you an ordered pair here. So remember, ordered pairs have the x first, and then the y value second. So to tell if this is the solution, you're going to replace the x and y over here with the numbers they give us. If I get a true statement, it's yes, a, a solution. If I get a false statement, then we put no. So the y, we're going to put a 5 in. So we get 5 equals 2 times x will be 2 times our 2 plus 1. So really, we got to work this right side. So bring down the 5. Uh, multiplying first, 2 times 2 is 4, plus my 1. So let's see, I get 5 equals 4 plus 1 is 5. Since that's a true statement, this is true. So this would be... Yes, a solution. Okay. So how about this? Is 3, negative 4 a solution of y equals 2x plus 1? So remember, I'm going to put that negative 4 in for the y. 3 in for the x, and I'm going to see if this thing is true or not. So I got a negative 4 equals 2 times 3 plus 1. So once again, working the right side, you're going to have negative 4. Multiply first, you get a 6 plus 1. So y'all, I'm going to end up with a negative 4 equals 7. That's a false statement, right? Negative four does not equal seven. So this one's false. So that means this is a no, not a solution.
Okay, so that's some of the stuff you'll see in the support. They'll do some problems um, where you're graphing straight lines. Um, they'll have a few of those straight lines where you got to solve it for the Y, like we did on 2.1 called algebra. Um, but I wanted to show y'all what they meant by this kind of stuff, okay? All right, y'all. So that's the end of this. So I'm going to stop sharing this page. And I'm to the point where I'm going to ask y'all if y'all have any questions. No question here. No. All right. And I'm sort of looking for my chat here. No questions. So I don't see nothing on the chat. So y'all, since y'all don't have any questions, we won't have to worry about our support tonight. I'm going to let y'all go. So let me stop this recording real quick so it'll start uploading.